Okay, so um, the next speaker is Nir and I give him the word. Thank you very much. Thank you for the organizing. Thank you for really uh, important and challenging talks. Um, so I, I, my, my title was uh, actually Longevity Genes. And in the last 48 hours, I was asked to talk about four other topics as well uh, within this time frame. So all, all I can do, and, and some of you before have assumed what I'm going to talk about. So what I'm going to do, I'm really going to make some provocations. That's all. I'm going to talk about three, four things and just make the provocations that I think are more important. And I do want to start with longevity genes. And those are, this is our poster family. Those are all siblings that live to be between 102 and 110 years old to show the effect of genetics on on longevity. Uh, we have more than 750 centenarians in our study now. We have offspring and controls, so we can do a lot with our studies. But I think the main thing that we, the main thing that we answered first, you know, the question was, are they getting, getting sick when everybody gets sick? And, and now they live sick for 40 additional years, or is their lifespan and health span goes together? And this is a paper together with Tom Pearl's group uh, that shows that centenarians actually live uh, 20, 30 years more healthier than, uh, than uh, other people. So it's about health span. And we, we know that there are those centenarians whose health span has been increased significant, or we could say their aging has been slowed significant. Um, and, and in fact, the most important thing about them is not only that they live healthier, but they had a, con, a constrict, contraction of morbidity at the end of their life. They lived, 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 and basically died within a few weeks, weeks or months. Even the CDC, we know a lot about the CDC recently, they looked at the medical cost of the last ten year, uh, two years of life of somebody who dies over the age of 100 or 70, and it's third the cost. Okay, so so we know that achieving health span and uh, is associated with um, with with what we call a longevity dividend, and that it's worth looking. But our biological um, mission was to find those longevity genes and develop drugs that will uh, affect them. Um, and uh, and this is, I, I took many slides that I had and just made one slide to tell you that in all longevity around, around the world, the genotypes of ApoE2, okay, not ApoE4 of Alzheimer, but up and not ApoE3, but ApoE2 is associated with exceptional longevity, and there's a, probably a biology behind that. And there's a specific genotypes of FOXO3A that came uh, from the East, actually, that uh, was validated many times over and seems to give some uh, protection against aging. Those are public, but when you go into population, you can see also specific genotypes. CTP and APOC3 are not common to everyone in the world, but their population in the world, that if they have this specific genotype, they live longer and healthier. In fact, uh, CTP and APOC3 are, are example of few, ge few genotypes that pharmaceutical went and developed antagonism against them and, and went through phase three to show that they are working. So our research have really been already translating. It's Merck for CTP and Ionis for ApoC3. One of the mistakes that people have is that they think that, well, uh, there's one longevity gene for everybody who lives above age 100. And in fact, where the research is as, and, and where we are at is that it's not about a common genotype, it's about clusters of genotypes in our population that have a functional um, consequence and look at them and see how they are related to aging and longevity. Just as an example, 2% of our centenarians have functional mutation in the IGF-1 receptor, okay? With this, we went back into the lab and we used IGF-1 
a receptor, an IGF-1 receptor antibody and showed that aging can be, that health span can be extended and lifespan can be extended with, uh, with this uh, antibody. So um, the, the idea of having um, a centenarians as rare population where aging is slowed is really picking up. And in fact, Regeneron and AFAR are going to announce soon launching a project of getting 10,000 centenarians, hopefully from all over the world, in order to get just more uh, statistics, more power, and finding everything important that we can find about this population. The last thing I want to say about these genetics is that the question was always, is longevity in humans similar to longevity in animals? Because everybody complains that the models that we use, the, the mice models that we used in the lab were not predictive of any treatment in humans. And we did, a, 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 so we have exome sequencing of all our population. And basically what we've done Zeng, with Zengdong Zhang is look at the, at rare genotypes. We're talking about less than 1% of our centenarians. So we have basically, uh, you know, somebody who has 16, centenarians have 16 variants and control F0 or one, th those kinds of, of data. But, but put them into pathways, okay? Put them into pathways and get some more information about the pathways and see what's coming up. And what's coming up is really incredible. What we're getting is exactly what we know from animal. Okay, like my kind is like insulin, IGF signaling pathway and mTOR signaling pathway. They're the top pathways that are coming out. So with, with uh, I'm going to leave uh, human genetics, but, but longevity, exceptional longevity is a good way to look at practically about aging and what can be targeted. And yes, when we're doing those studies, we are getting the results of the animals because our whole concept was that aging is conserved. Okay. I'm moving out to make a comment about biomarkers. And remember that the, the most important thing of, of biomarkers is that they change with treatment. And the sooner the change, the better. The better. We don't want, want to wait months or years for a biomarker to change. We want to be, do study that we will get results immediately and know what's going on. And this is limitation in many ways of the methylation. The methylation in our hands is very stable. It doesn't go that fast. Uh, 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 and, and actually the studies, which we saw the only good example of nine people, but the studies are, are not really uh, uh, that great or they're, they're not, they cannot be the only thing we trust. And what we did is we uh, collaborated with Somalogy on our a study and never mind the technology, but we're measuring 5,000 proteins in 1,000 people between the age 65 and 95. And we're basically asking what changes between 65 and 95. We had the Nature Medicine paper collaboration with other groups that looked at all ages, but you know what? Everything really happens between 65 and 95. We have two additional uh, aging cell papers coming out soon about this proteome. But the bottom line is, this is a volcano plot. I'm not going to uh, educate you too much, but those hot lava plot, the reds, uh, if they're going high enough, this is the p-value. So we're talking about 10 to the minus 80. And uh, if they're going far enough, like with BNP, that's how effective it is. And what we see is that we have lots of significant uh, proteins. And as Josh said before, you know, those proteins, some of them may be uh, cause aging, but some of them might be protective against aging and we have to distinguish between them. And, and here we found something really interesting and very relevant for a biomarker that change with treatment. When we do a pathway analysis, and there's many ways to do pathway analysis, uh, on one hand, the, again, the, the, the most uh, uh, significant pathway is the insulin uh, growth factor pathway. It's really interesting. But what you see here in reds are all breakdown products. There's breakdown of the extrular metrics of collagen, 
of neutrophil degranulation, uh, of platelets uh, degranulation. And at first I said, what is this noise? I don't, I don't learn anything from a breakdown project programs. But then I realized, you know, no matter how we're going to treat aging, we have to stop this breakdown. Okay, I think this breakdown is going to be extremely important proteomic markers. And we should show in therapy that we're stopping this breakdown, no matter what we do. I think it's a major can be a major component of proteomics for aging. Uh, I would just tell you in our studies that those thousand people, half of them were people out of the community without family history of longevity. And half of them were people uh, who are children of centenarians. And we showed that they are much healthier. And what you see here, you see that it's red here and much more white here because because while our offspring had 585 proteins that were significantly changed, um, the offspring had only 235. In other words, they are still younger. <laughs> you know, they'll get there when they'll get to their biological age. A and in fact, what we're finding with them is that they have 29 proteins that the others don't have. And some of those proteins seems to be protective against aging uh, also. So. Uh, there is a discovery uh, part here. I also want to say something else that somebody said before, or one of the comments. A female, you know, male have 600 proteins that are changing and females have 250 proteins that are changing. The, the proton of the women is much more stable. And we have to recognize that we have to do age specific in aging. There's no way around it, even when it comes to biomarker. And of course, we can uh, build the clocks. And the clock that we've built showed that our biological age by proteomic is much better than chronological age and even uh, frailty. So those are the kind of things that we want to know and want to follow. So, so this is the uh, provocation about proteomic. Uh, they need to reflect treatment. We want to see fast effect of treatment. Proteomics are going to be important. Um, now, uh, the challenge that we have, and that was mentioned before, is that aging is not known as an indication. And, uh, and it's a problem. It's a problem because we need somebody to um, agree that aging can be prevented. That's the best we want to do, that aging can be prevented and that there is an indication for prevention and that pharmaceutical will jump up to the increasing number of biotechs and start uh, collaborating and funding a lot of what's going on there. So can we do something about the regulation? And the answer is that we found a terrific tool uh, to use, and this is metformin because metformin extends a, a lifespan and health span in animals. And we recently showed, those are here, down here are all the hallmarks of aging. And we showed that no matter, uh, that when we looked at the literature, uh, metformin seems to affect all the hallmarks of aging. Now, I, I, I don't really believe that in the sense that there's a direct effect, but it's common to every drug that you intervene with sirtuin, with resveratrol, right? With rapamycin, uh, with metformin, if you really target aging, you're going, let, let, let's talk about the cell that now is becoming younger. Well, you're going to fix lots of things. Okay, so at the end, you get of a lot, a lot of effect and we can argue which is primary and which is secondary. And I don't know what metformin is doing first. Okay, but at the end, we can see the whole hallmarks of aging being affected. And that's why one of the interesting thing about the hallmark of aging is there, there's the connectivity between them. We know that we target one and we approve the other. It's because we're going to do, we're doing something significant about aging. Uh, and of course, we know from both clinical and association studies that uh, metformin prevent diabetes and prevent cardiovascular disease that people with metformin have much less cancer, 
There's clinical study, one recent that shows that people on metformin have less Alzheimer and less, uh, 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 less uh, MCI or progression of MCI. And, you know, I think it's really interesting from the UK, this study that showed that people of more, uh, on metformin who have diabetes and are obese and are sick to begin with have less mortality than people who are treating by the same doctors, the same pharmacies who don't have diabetes, okay? So you can see that you can actually measure metformin's effect on many outcomes or on cluster of outcomes that include a, a mortality. A, we are talking about a drug that's really cheap, safe. As I said, we're using it more as a tool because we need to repurpose a drug <laughs> in order to just uh, basically show that the concept that we have is working. And the way that we're going to do it is we're going to take uh, people between 65 and 80 years old. Um, we don't care what diseases they have and what diseases they're going to get. That's not the point. We're saying no matter what you have, we're going to, if you're on metformin, it's going to get later, you're going to get it later. So there are 3,000 people, half of them are our own placebo, and we have clinical outcomes that the FDA want, and we are supporter for the biomarker part by uh, the NIA grant. Unfortunately, TAME was on hold because of many reasons. The most important is the COVID. And I, I'll tell you, I, I feel lucky that we didn't start TAME last year because it would have been a disaster now. But we're ready to move whenever, uh, whenever COVID uh, allows us. So uh, I think I took a lot of time. Let me stop here and I'll be able, uh, happy to answer question now or later at the web. Thank you for uh, listening. Thank you so much for your interesting talk. Um, I would actually like to start with a question of my own. Um, so you published a paper in Nature Medicine last year uh, showing that uh, the plasma changes in, uh, in the proteins happen in like these three waves. Uh, and I wonder if you have any idea of what could be the reason it happens in waves and not uh, in a more continuous fashion. Yeah, I, you know, so that, that's a great question. Look, I don't see aging as linear. And, and we have to know that, you know, when we're talking about uh, walking speed or, um, you know, hand grip and stuff, this is going to be stable for lots of decades, okay? much more stable than what happens between 65 and 80 years old. So I don't think that aging is linear. I also don't think, in, in fact, I know, those proteomics that I showed you are breakdown. They don't go, they don't happen in young people. Most of them are not happening. The overlap is 1%. They don't happen in young people. So this aging is accelerating at age 65. We're starting to have this breakdown and we're starting to have uh, uh, the other, th you know, the other things. And, and we have to realize that that is the point where we have to um, intervene and we know what we're looking at. Okay. Uh, well, I see that actually uh, two people at least are asking about pain. Uh, so do you have an idea when it will start? Will it be immediately after COVID is uh, controlled? Uh, you know, uh, it's... Uh, <laughs> we say about the future, right? But, but uh, the, we have 14 uh, centers around the United States. And uh, in my view, the New York, uh, the Einstein and the Harvard Center are kind of ready to go. We're starting to opening, to open everything, you know? So it is possible that we'll stagger, but we want to start. Uh, uh, Connecticut also has a, has a, actually has a center. So I, I think we can start starting where, where we can start. And we're adjusting our protocol from point of view visits. We are all doing it. We can have really good control by electronics these day and we can uh, manage the, uh, the visits much differently than we used to uh, before. Okay, thank you so much for your lecture. Uh, we are going to have a pause now. There are some more questions in the chat so you can answer them there. Uh, thanks again for the lecture and let's take 10 minutes break. Uh,
get some coffee and I see you back in 10 minutes.